great things with the song. I, I absolutely, every time, hope to sing every verse of that song because that, that last line of, uh, oh, make me thine indeed, that is, that is my perpetual prayer. And uh, I'll tell you before, as we get into today's lesson, one of the things that does make me nervous, uh, even though I, I know there is a distinction between Ireland and England, is I'm absolutely convinced I'm going to mispronounce the name of every English town. So, I hope you are. Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate she that. She corrects me all the time. I, I, I have a pal in the, at the Logan Institute, Brother Ben Diamond, who is a, who's from Manchester, and uh, uh, he, he would fix this every time I present to our institute faculty. So I'm not, I'm not afraid of being wrong. Okay, so last time, Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith had escaped from jail. The saints were living in Quincy. Uh, they began to buy property from a, uh, a land speculator in Commerce <coughs> and uh, Montrose, Iowa, and began to, uh, to populate up into Nauvoo, the beautiful swamp. And the big decision, the big decision was whether or not the saints should congregate again. Because that had, that had been our problem. And I, I think it really was true that uh, you know, the adage goes that Latter-day Saints are like manure. If you spread us around, we'll make everything green. And if you pile us in one place, we'll just start to stink. <laughs> I don't know that that's entirely true, depending on how recently you've been to Utah County. <laughs> Um, but uh, Joseph Smith actually received inspiration. He cried out, Lord, what wilt thou have me do? And the answer was, build up a city and call my saints to this place. That, that was the Lord's instruction. And so the, uh, the Nauvoo migration began. And as the saints began to settle in Nauvoo, the nature of the swamp uh, in that, that summer of 39 began to weigh on them as, as uh, everybody uh, epidemically came down with malaria, which there were treatments that, you know, people were exper experimenting with Peruvian bark and, and some things that would ease the symptoms of malaria. But even epidemiolo epidemiologically, uh, we didn't know exactly what caused that mosquito-borne disease at the time. Hence the name, uh, you know, bad air. We just thought it was swamp living and people were coming down and they called it the ague and they'd shake and they'd get fevers and chills and throw up and die and, you know, <coughs> the saints would lay in, in uh, <coughs> this, this painting depicts, depicts what was described in history as the saints would come to Joseph Smith's house, collapse on his lawn where Emma and Joseph would, would nurse them. That, uh, that heartbreaking scene just, uh, just moves my soul as you think about these people who had just experienced horror in Missouri and, and uh, great, uh, great peril, I guess, crossing Missouri in February winter, and now, now they are struck with with a disease that uh, that is laying them low. And uh, in July of 1839, Joseph Smith uh, is called it in the uh, histories the day of God's power. Joseph Smith started with the with the homes of the twelve. Brigham Young uh, was was sick. Uh, you know, bedridden sick. He, he said in one, in one time, and I don't think it was this particular ailment, but at one time he was sick for 18 days. He laid on his back with fever and chills and, and couldn't even be uh, rolled or rotated. And after the 18th day and the fever broke, they sat him in a chair, but he was so overwhelmed by the fever that he couldn't close his eyes. And it was just like he was... a. Uh, was in a, a awakened coma and his wife, his wife threw cayenne pepper in his face to try to get him to respond and because also we didn't understand medicine. <laughs> so she 
least him. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> on this occasion, Brigham Young describes himself as shaking with the, with the chills and the fever. And Joseph Smith laid his hands upon him and blessed him in the name of the Lord. And Brigham Young got up. And those those apostles began <coughs> training Joseph Smith like a pied piper of of miraculous healing and began circulating through uh, not well commerce and across the river in Montrose and um, oh man that should have uh, animated I'm going to take the time out because we're at the beginning of this and somebody's calling my sister sorry it was mine uh, go ahead and take it because uh, <laughs> All right. I want to get uh, this quote up. Yeah, there we go. It came to the house of Leiden Fordham, which is is among the most famous because this one was recorded as the, as they come to Brother Fordham's house. Joseph says, "Elijah, do you not know me?" With a low whisper, Brother Fordham answered, "Yes." The prophet then said, "Have you not faith to be healed?" The answer, which was a little plainer than before, was, I am afraid it is too late. If you had come sooner, I think I might have been. Does that, does that give you Book of John uh, references to Mary and Martha? As Martha comes to the Savior after the death of Lazarus and said, if you could have come in on time. Um, there's a, there's a, a miracle principle in that, isn't there? <laughs> think we should tag it to Martha more than to Elijah Fordham, but uh, have you noticed how often the Lord comes at the last hour? Um, to Joseph Smith in the grove when he was about ready to yield himself to the invisible power, to the disciples on the sea rowing against the wind at, at the uh, third third watch, and this, the your, our own lives, and maybe it's a little bit about like I found my keys in the last place I looked, just because we stopped looking, at, or you know, the Savior came to me at the climax of my distress, only because it began to abate from the the time you received the Lord. But I believe, I believe, that's what we ought to expect. Martha and Elijah Fordham, and I. I think this has gone too far. O oh Lord, where is the pavilion that covered thy hiding place? And the reason? The reason is the significance of agency in faith. If, if a faithful life was a straight road with parking spots next to the store and no red lights, we would not be agents who act. We would be objects. We would be objects of the smooth trail. The Lord has fortunately, blessedly, given us these pains, trials, and afflictions, which he doesn't remove immediately, so that we continue to grow in faith and say like the three, the three Hebrew boys in the book of Daniel, you know, we, the Lord will save us, but if not, but if not, we still will not call upon the idol. Our faith continues to grow as, as we're in this distress. But then, Joseph then said, do you believe that Jesus, that Jesus is the Christ? I do, Brother Joseph, was the response. Then the prophet of God spoke with a loud voice, and in the majesty of of the Godhead, Elijah, I command you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth to arise and be made whole. Second principle of truth in that. <coughs> one, of the, one of the side effects of, of our faith often is that we wind up putting our faith on the thing rather than in the source. You know we do that. I hear people talk about, you know, even the Leahona, that what a magical instrument that must have been to Lehi. It wasn't. It wasn't magic. 
it, and it didn't even have to be a curious, uh, a ball of curious workmanship, because it just was the thing that the Almighty was working through. Did Joseph Smith have power to heal people? And the answer is no. Does any priesthood holder have the power to heal people? No. Do the Sisters of Zion have the power to heal people? No. And here's why. Where does the power to miraculously heal come from? It comes from Jesus Christ. Elijah, I command you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, as if Jesus of Nazareth was holding Elijah toward him by the hand. That, that adds to our doctrine of true priesthood, doesn't it? Because if it's not the object, then there is healing power that can flow through every one of us according to our faith in Jesus Christ. Now, I, sisters, I wouldn't go laying on of hands because, <laughs> frankly, that's been reserved for another place. But none of us should be afraid to let the Lord flow through us. And none of us should be hesitant to find the Lord's power flowing through things we might not have expected. Can I have an amen? amen. Moses' staff, the Ark of the Covenant, Leona, the seer stone, the Urim and Thumma, all just things. Joseph Smith, just a <coughs> dude. <coughs> There's Brother Fordham who lived to good old age. He winds up being the, the sculptor who carved the oxen for the, uh, the Nauvoo Temple originally. And there's his headstone in Utah where uh, we ought to go visit on a field trip. The worst field trip in the world. I mean, she's driving a bus around cemeteries. <laughs> that guy was cool. That lady was cool. So many times. That person. <laughs> That's been your favorite vacation. Oh. What cemetery is that in? Uh, Salt Lake. When, uh, when I go to the Salt Lake Cemetery, at first just started doing laps and looking at all the prophets, and then I started learning about more people, and so I'd have to stop and say, well, you know, this guy. And then I started learning controversies, which was even better. And I'd say, this lady was secretly sealed to that guy, but married. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just ask, or I just am wondering, in our day and age, how do we, how do we necessarily see God's power or put our trust in a liahona? And I think sometimes it's by our our culture, and because I don't know if it's a commandment, but you know things like family home evening and scripture study, which are absolutely great things but I think sometimes we we think well I did this I did this with my family every day why didn't it happen and I think we need to remember that it takes God's power to to be there and and that there's still agency kind of there's, kind there's of still agency because like like uh, Nephi said about the Leahona when he said and I discovered that it, it worked according to the faith, heed, and diligence. The, the, magic, <laughs> the magic could be turned on, but agency had to be used, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not family home evening. Family home evening, home evening is just a thing. But it is when, when that thing is approached with faith, heed, and diligence. When, when Russell Nelson... Uh, Hundred-year-old guy. Who else? Who else in this planet trusts a hundred-year-old guy? I listen to pundits talking about well, Joe Biden. That guy's delirious. You can't have a president that old. <laughs> <laughs> Said every well. <laughs> in case our old guy doesn't have enough strength. He's surrounded by two other old guys. <laughs> Bless Elijah Fordham. Bless the thing again, because let's not get. Uh, well, this is this is Wilford Weather. While waiting for the ferry boat, a man of the world, knowing of the miracles which had been performed, came to him, Joseph, and asked him if he would not go and heal.
two twin children of his, about five months old, who were both lying sick, nigh unto death. They were some two miles from Montrose. The prophet said he could not go. But after pausing some time, he said he would send one to heal them. And he turned to me and said, you go with the man and heal his children. I went with the man and did as, as the prophet commanded me, and the children were healed. Part of that is that Wilfred Woodruff carried with him Joseph Smith's red handkerchief, which he put on the children to bless them. It wasn't the handkerchief, <coughs> and it wasn't Wilfred Woodruff. <coughs> His story reminds me of one that comes to us out of the book of Mark. When, when Jesus descends with Peter, James, and John off the Mount of Transfiguration, and there's a man whose child is taken with an affliction for many years, and the apostles say to Jesus, uh, we haven't been able to heal him. And Jesus says, oh, ye of little faith, how long shall I be with you? And I've heard talks on this that, that, that interpret that as Jesus speaking to the apostles and said, why didn't you have enough faith to heal this boy? And I don't think he was talking to the apostles. I think he was talking about the apostles. And he was saying to the, uh, to the people who had come to be healed, that only believed they could be healed if it was Jesus himself who laid his hands on their head. And Jesus is saying, ye of little faith, how long will I be with you? If you can't receive Wilfred Woodruff, receiving Joseph Smith wouldn't matter. Right? Because it was the power of God. And, uh, and that's, we know that. We know that a blessing from, from the newest elder in the church carries the same potential of power as it does from the from the bishop, from the state president, from the member of the twelve. And we need to remind ourselves of this. Well, Zina Huntington's mother had passed away during this affliction. But Zina is speaking with the prophet Joseph Smith concerning the loss of her mother. This comes out of, uh, is quoted in Saints, but I'm taking it out of uh, Susan Young Gates' history. And in her intense grief, she asked the question, well, I know my mother as my mother when I get over on the other side. Certainly we will, was the instant reply of the prophet. More than that, he said, you will meet and become acquainted with your eternal mother, the wife of your father in heaven. And ha have I then a mother in heaven? exclaimed the astonished <coughs> girl. You assuredly have. How could a father claim his title? unless there were also a mother to share that parenthood. Um, <coughs> I'll, bear my <coughs> I'll bear my testimony that that is true. Let me also share a truth that I've learned from the New Testament. What God has joined together, let no man divide asunder. Sometimes there's a tendency, once uh, Latter-day Saints learn of the Divine Mother, that they, they feel like, well, I would like to turn to her because she will understand my, my grief. She will understand the complexity of my life. And my testimony is, what God has joined together, let no man divide asunder. It's not that the Divine Mother has compassion and the Divine Father has justice. It's that divine people have a fullness of every, every capacity and every empathy, right? As we pray to our Heavenly Father, as we pray to our Heavenly Father, we uh, do not separate them. And, and thus we see that we follow the pattern that the Savior taught us when he said, after this manner, pray ye our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. There's the doctrine, and there's the practice out of that. Any questions? Next. <laughs> Not everybody gets healed. <coughs> Bishop Edward Partridge, a hero, a hero of the restoration. Bishop Partridge passes away at 47. There's a guy. From the minute he becomes an officer of the church, the presiding bishop, he deals with financial dis uh, downturn after financial downturn, right? We think sometimes, oh, that hard bishop, he's got, he's got two trailer parks in his neighborhood. 
He had an entire country in depression, right? In Kirtland, and then in Jackson County, where he was wh whipped, beaten, and tarred. In Far West, uh, across the uh, across the the uh, Missouri, uh, while he tries to help the Saints in Exodus, and then he passes away at 47 years <coughs> old, which is uh, is too dang young for a hero of the Restoration. The patriarch Joseph Smith Sr. passes away at this time as well. Uh, at 69 years old, from the same distresses, from the same hardships. Listen to what the Lord says, though, in section 124 of these great souls. That when he shall finish his work, I may receive him unto myself, even as I did my servant David Patton, who is with me at this time, and also my servant Edward Partridge, and also my aged servant Joseph Smith Sr., who sitteth with Abraham at his right hand, and blessed, and holy is he, for he is mine. Oh, make me thine indeed, thou blessed son. And, and this promise, this promise that these, these faithful officers of the priesthood passed away in righteousness, received unto, unto the Lord, sat at the right hand of Abraham, which is, by the way, code for exaltation, right? blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are e immortality and eternal life. And uh, thank you for the memories of those heroes of the restoration. <coughs> so what you take home, I hope, whatever you will, but something I have learned from the great poet Sammy Hagar in 1987 <laughs> who said, if you want faith, you must believe a little. That that is, that is one of the most brilliant things about faith. He also said if you want peace, you've got to turn the cheek a little. And if you want love, you've got to get a, give a little because you've got to give, you've got to give, you've got to give to live. Yeah. <laughs> but if you want faith, you must believe a little. You've got to find that impossible thing and focus a belief on that. How does Alma say it? If you cannot eat but exercise a particle of faith to believe, to exercise uh, this faith. Just, can we be healed? Can this be fixed? Can the Lord uh, interrupt my life for this? If you want faith, you got to believe a little. Said uh, I didn't include this one on it, but uh, you know the story about faith from Alice in Wonderland. So if, if it's not a, a rocker that I will quote, it is a uh, opium opium delirious Lewis Carroll who spoke uh, but in, in the Alice's exchange with the, with the white queen she's, she tells her something she says well I can't believe in that and she says well I don't I imagine you haven't tried well that's uh, impossible to believe in and the queen says I try to believe in at least ten impossible things before breakfast <laughs> I, and that's a I could have quoted that better but just can we just believe a little and watch that faith grow. Uh, when you leave the water, do you get into the garden? <coughs> into the garden so you have to be able to I, I believe that. I believe that with every Indiana Jones part of my theology. <laughs> it will not come unless you take the step from the lion's head. It is an act of faith, right? Without seeing it. a celestial principle in suffering. And it is it is that is that nature of the choice of our parents Adam and Eve and if and us respectively that we that we choose this path of thorns and thistles and noxious weeds with the promise that that push against that push against an opposing force our sorrows our sufferings is the thing that develops our strength. 
Patricia Holland said this about faith, which I think is brilliant. I don't think faith is faith until that's all you have to hang on to. That's the step into the darkness. That's the boldness to do a thing that does not make sense because you think the Lord is inspiring you to do it. And you cultivate that and you watch it grow and you watch faith become, become a real thing. And you in your own lives, I've just taught you about the draining of the swamp experiences and, and everything and, and gave you a ton of my opinions. But would you ponder on, would you ponder on this lesson as you go home in peace and safety? And think about how this is going to help us be closer to the Savior in your own life. And, and in the faith of the Leahona, the God teach you personally through this platform that's just a thing. All right. I did not save enough time, but I'm doing it. So buckle up. <laughs> because it's at this time that the apostles leave for England. Now Heber C. Kimball and, and Elder Hyde and Elder Richards and Elder Fielding, they, they've been there. They opened up England in the first mission when Heber C. Kimball took these, uh, these guests and they went to England in 1837 from Kirtland. And there's the place where they stayed. Uh, it still exists. And Well, that's the place. When <coughs> Elder Kimball and Elder Hyde came <coughs> out, they left 41-year-old Joseph, Joseph Fielding as the president of the mission with his first counselor, Elder Willard Richards, who was 34, and Elder William Clayton, who was 24 years old. All three of these guys <laughs> were, were single. We got one single adult and two uh, mid-singles, I guess we would call them in today's vocabulary. Uh, while they're there, Elder Fielding gets married and... Elder Richards gets married. Elder Richards, you, I hope you remember this story. Her maiden name was, was Richards, Janetta Richards. And Heber C. Kimball, when he baptized her, he wrote a letter to Willard and said, I baptized your wife today. <laughs> and, and when Willard met her, he said, Richards is a fine name. I should not ever want to change it. And she said, I agree. <laughs> it was love at first sight. Um, William Clayton will not marry till he gets to America, but we love that guy. Oh boy, if if there wasn't if if we could get all of his Nauvoo journals, which are just classics to our church history, and just thought just thought on one thing: why should we mourn or or think <coughs> our life is hard? Is not so. All is right. Why should we think to earn a great reward if we now shun the fight? Gird up your loins, fresh courage take. Our God will never us forsake. Even when there's a pavilion that covereth his hiding place. That poetry, that poetry should be tattooed backwards in invisible ink that we can only see when we turn on ultraviolet lights in our bathroom. Just look at it. Uh, Elder Clayton uh, went to Manchester and started a branch with 240 members. Ah, oh, the people of England were so hungry for the, the gospel. And the mission of the Twelve starts in 1840, and you know it started uh, from far west in 1838. We know that uh, the Lord in 38 said, next year, from this spot in April, go on your mission. Brigham Young and the, the handful of the missionaries sneak back into, into Missouri and set each other apart. But then they go back to Nauvoo, where they they get malaria. And so they they are struck sick uh, until September. From April, when they set themselves apart as missionaries, to September, they are sick. When Brigham Young finally realizes it's time for him to get up and get going, he uh, gets up, he leaves his wife uh, sick and pregnant. He has somebody rolling across the Mississippi because he's living in a, in a cabin in Iowa. And he makes it as far as Heber C. Kimball's home in Nauvoo. Not, not the one that's been restored when you take trips, but an a earlier one. He falls sick and lays sick in Heber C. Kimball's home for nine more days before he and Heber get enough strength to prop each other up and walk out to a wagon. And as they're driving away, uh, 
they look back at uh, the sick home and and like Kimball with uh, their children and just what in the heck are we doing? We ought to give them a cheer, right? So they, they rise up and shout, go Chiefs, beat 49ers. <laughs> What's the cheer? You know it. Hurrah for Israel. Right? Hurrah for Israel. Here we go. John Taylor's the first to leave Nauvoo. He leaves Nauvoo penniless. <coughs> he just takes off walking <coughs> like some hobo on his way, knowing that he's going to get to England somehow. Oh, the faith. Wilford Woodruff gets up, starts walking, collapses on a on a sheet of shoe leather outside a boot shop. I like to picture it in the boot shop that's that's been restored in Nauvoo. I, I don't know if it was. But he's laying there on this on this leather just miserable. And Joseph Smith comes up to him and he says, What are you doing, Elder Woodruff? And he says, I feel more like a candidate for the dissecting table than as a missionary. And Joseph Smith says, God did not call you to be a corpse. Get up and get going. <laughs> Thanks for the compassion. <laughs> so Brigham Young and he, uh, leaves his wife and makes Heber C. Kimball's house. Heber C. Kimball, they leave with the cheer. George A. Smith makes it to uh, to his uncle uncle uh, Joseph Senior's house and he falls down and the patriarch says, "Who's robbing the burying yard?" Now the patriarch's only only months away from passing away himself, but he blesses young George and sends him on his mission. Harley P. Pratt leaves, Orson Pratt, uh, Willard Richards. Uh, Willard Richards is already in England. He stayed. Orson Hyde takes off. Johnny Page, Johnny Page gets started and then comes back, and William Smith just never even goes. So let's take a look at what's going on in England. This the, uh, the symbols, by the way, are a tribute to my <coughs> friend Ben Diamond, who, uh, who always reminds me that football should be played with one's feet. <laughs> Elder Richards, 36 years old, stays in England, keeps the gospel going, kind of out at church headquarters in Preston. John Taylor gets there and begins to spread the gospel. Uh, he's, he goes from Liverpool to Ireland. Uh, he, he's only there for 10 days, and then he comes back to the Isle of Man, but he baptizes 27 people in two months in Liverpool. Then he has a vision, just like just like Paul of the of the, the the man in Philippi, and he has the vision of this man praying for the gospel. So he goes to Ireland, and, and in 10 days he baptizes 35 people and organizes a branch. He comes to the Isle of Man and baptizes uh, 90 there. John Tate is walking with him. And, uh, and Elder Taylor explains the gospel to Brother Tate. And Brother Tate says, well, that makes sense to me. And just like Philip the Evangelist, Elder Taylor says, well, here is water. Would you like to get baptized? They step off the side of the road, and John Taylor <coughs> baptizes John Tate. And I started trying <coughs> to hook him up. I wanted to see if he came west or whose ancestor he was, but I, I got distracted. In his preaching, uh, he, he finds uh, his wife's relatives, the Cannon family, and he teaches George Cannon Sr. And when George Cannon gets the Book of Mormon, he reads it and says, no wicked man could write such a book as this, and no good man would write it unless it were true and he were commanded of God to do so. I bear my testimony of the Book of Mormon and that truth. There is, that's why I, I invite people, as, as I've had chances uh, since my missionary life, to invite people to read the Book of Mormon. While I was a missionary, I, I failed very much at this, even though the Lord succeeded. But I would ask people to pray if the Book of Mormon was true. I've, I've since realized, of course, that's a ridiculous question. You don't have to ask God if a thing you can hold in your hand is true. You have to ask God if the things that are in it are true. And what is it? It's another testament of Jesus Christ. Witnessing to Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ. 
that ought to be our question. Would you read this and then ask God, the eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are true? What things? If Jesus is the Christ, the very God of Israel, who manifested himself to all people, and does this book tell you that? You don't even have to pray to know that. And so we're going to every page, if every page after page after page teaches us of the truth of Jesus Christ, no wicked man could have composed that. No wicked man would have written a book to drive people, <coughs> draw people, tie people to Jesus Christ. Amen? Yeah. And a fraud and a forger could not, could not have had that kind of power. Thank you, Brother Cannon. You do know Brother Cannon's son, George Q., who will live a life in the First Presidency as a counselor to Brigham Young in his childhood almost, and as a counselor to John Taylor, Wilfred Woodruff, and Joseph F. Smith when he will pass away. One of, uh, one of the most relevant people to the foundation of the church in the Mountain West. If we get that far in our semesters, I'll be, you know, I'll, I have a man crush on George Q. Cannon. <laughs> <laughs> Said John Taylor about the ministers in Liverpool, they were so good in general and so pure that they had no room for the gospel. They were too holy to be righteous, too good to be pure. They had no room for the gospel and had too much religion to enter the kingdom of heaven. I think that is a temptation that we as Latter-day Saints uh, face from time to time, isn't it? Can I, uh, homeless guy walks into the steak center, stinky and smelly and uh, just looking for a way to get, to get out of Fremont. took him to the grocery store and he and I walked into Ridley's and man were there a lot of people that were curious about President Reese in his suit walking through Ridley's on a Sunday. What should I have done? I should have gone to the grocery store, bought that man a loaf of bread. Let's let us not be have too much religion to enter the kingdom of heaven, or have too much gospel to be holy or to be righteous. Amen? Amen. Amen. Bless his heart. Elder Taylor left Lenore at home in a cabin in Montrose. She was eight months pregnant with three other little children. Here's a, one of the letters that she wrote to John. Can you, can you decipher it? Absolutely. She, she wrote a letter and then turned it sideways and wrote another letter. We had diaries. She wrote him an interesting place, but we had diaries from my great grandfather who was doing exactly that. When he was in India to save paper, he would write them one way and then turn them around in another way. And my, my sister has managed to infect them. <laughs> whatever you want it to mean. <laughs> Brigham Young sets up a headquarters in Manchester. His favorite place to preach was called the cockpit. It, it, was, a, it, it was a place where rooster fights used to be held. By this time, it, it wasn't kind of like an auditorium, but this was his original vision for the, uh, the first tabernacle, the old tabernacle that they first built of adobe on Temple Square was built like this with this kind of a theater in the round setting because that's the way Brigham Young had learned to preach in, in Manchester. Said, said his biographer, Young prompted an eruption of spiritual gifts, intending not only to reap converts but to mold them into men and women of spiritual power. He talked about, he talked about speaking in tongues. Now we, do, we don't count on that spiritual gift as much nowadays. It doesn't mean as much to us as it did to them in this proto-evangelical world or Pentecostal world. But he encouraged spiritual gifts. 
He wanted these members to experiment with what it felt like to be guided by the Holy Ghost, to speak with power and authority, to, uh, to lay hands and heal. He wanted them to experiment with that and learn how to do it, not just so that they, they would have converse and people say, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost, but so that they could become men and women of spiritual power. And you've got to think that. You've got to think about your uh, British converts if they came from this generation and that power to get them on boats and that power to get them across the plains and that power to say, yeah, I'll give it a shot in Box Elder County. <laughs> there was a spiritual power in these, in these men and women because of spiritual gifts that President Young taught them. And anybody want to try to read this in his, uh, in his writing? <coughs> Speaking of Manchester, the atmosphere is so darkened with the coal that there, the, the air is so thick with it, the eye cannot penetrate but a little ways. <laughs> that, that was Dickens' England, right? He publishes the Book of Mormon in England. That was easy. He writes to Joseph one day and says, this is class brigand, isn't it? Our motto is go ahead, and ahead we are determined to go, till we've conquered every foe. So come life or come death, we'll go ahead. But tell us if we're going wrong, and we will write it. <laughs> A couple things I encourage you to notice about President Young's faith and testimony in there is, for just for heaven's sakes, do it. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Secondly, I might be wrong. In fact, I hope I am. If I am wrong, somebody point it out, and I will change it. Stop being embarrassed about repentance. Just point it out. Get what the heck. I, if I'm going wrong, we'll write it. We'll try better tomorrow. I love you, Brigham <coughs> Young. During the years of Brigham Young's mission, the British church would grow to 6,000 members. Around 800, while he's there, would start sailing to America. 1,000 more would follow. During this time, Mary Ann kept house in 11 different places within three months. She's pregnant with five children when he, when he leaves, and at one time, she rode across the Mississippi River with a newborn baby uh, strapped to her for the baby's warmth and so she could row, soaking wet in November while suffering from malaria in order to acquire food for her starving family. And then she built a cabin with her bare hands in Nauvoo. I, 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 on one hand, you could say, ah, Brigham, you shouldn't have left her. On the other hand, you should say, Mary Ann Angel Young, you've got grit. There's a power in you that we just haven't written enough biographies about. Heber C. Kimball goes to London. He starts some work uh, by visiting his old stomping grounds, and he writes to uh, he writes to Willard Richards about you know because he had left Willard in charge of the work that he had done, and he says to Willard, "I'm glad to learn of the prosperity of the work in this part of the land. You say that the devil is mad. This makes me glad, and I shall not try to please him." He goes to London, where he gets a front row. Uh, for a royal uh, royal procession with the young Queen Victoria. Oh, said his grandson, it was on this occasion that Heber C. Kimball blessed Queen Victoria. Well, without taking too much time to read this whole thing, but, uh, but so the young Victoria comes across and uh, Elder Kimball says, next slide, Elder Kimball says, God bless you. As one would. God save the queen, God bless. But Elder Kimball did not consider that to be a just passing God bless you. He considered that to be an apostolic blessing. <laughs> Said the servant of the Lord to Queen Victoria, God bless you. And, and that's how colonialism ruined India and Africa. <laughs> to die and, and writes to Heber that 
she has not had a month without without chills, and she once had a, an episode that lasted for a solid hour. But if she lives, she lives for God, and if she dies, she dies in the name of the Lord. Parley P. Pratt sets up headquarters in Manchester where this guy starts publishing. He publishes a, a, a response to the anti-Mormon book, Mormonism Unveiled. He publishes the voice of warning. The voice of warning probably, apart from the Book of Mormon, becomes the number one missionary tract that is used for decades after Parley <laughs> publishes it. His biographer, <laughs> Terrell Givens, calls Parley the Paul of Mormonism. And I like that idea because, you know, Paul didn't invent Christianity, but Paul wrote about it, and Paul turned it into a, uh, a marketable, here's a better word, he turned it into a deliverable package. And Party P. Pratt puts voice to the ideas and the theology that Joseph is receiving for, from the Lord, and uh, publishes, I don't mean to click with John, but I, he publishes the Millennial Star, and starts writing hymns. And, uh, and I hope, I, I don't care what they do with the new hymn book. I really hope Stairway to Heaven and Don't Stop Believing are in there. But <laughs> if they drop out, if they drop out hymns by W.W. W. Phelps and Party P. Pratt and William Clayton, I'll be a Methodist. But <laughs> I'm just kidding. The morning breaks. Sing this, sing this like you would if you were Party P. Pratt and lived most of your adult life without, without the power of the gospel. And then you hear the ideas and theologies from Joseph Smith and you start writing them down. The morning breaks, the shadows flee. Lo, Zion's standard is unfurled. The dawning of brighter day and majestic rises on the world. The clouds of error disappear before the rays of truth divine. The glory bursting from afar, wide o'er the nations, soon will shine. I don't know if we all appreciate what it's like to come from a Calvinist background and have the clouds of error disappear. To come from a setting where only God's elect, by God's will alone, can, can be saved. And that cloud of error disappears and, and you realize, you realize, I think I, we all, I think we all are going to walk back into heaven's blessed presence and be like him. <laughs> Just by the way, before Parley leaves to England, Joseph, uh, we'll talk about this next time, but Joseph has gone to, to Washington and Parley's hanging out in Philadelphia trying to earn money. He, uh, he traveled with his wife because, do you remember where Parley has, <coughs> has been? Just before the mission, he's been in the Richmond jail, uh, accused of murder, until he's able to escape in in April. And he gets back with his wife, and so he decides she's coming with him. So they're together in Philadelphia. He's trying to save some, make some money, get boat passage, and Joseph Smith stops by Philadelphia, and and that's the first time, the first time that's recorded that anybody says, "I heard Joseph Smith tell me." Then the love of my life can be my partner and my wife forever. It's 1840. It's 1840 before a Latter-day Saint learns that. It's 1840 before an apostle says, you mean Marianne can be with me forever? Marianne, by the way, was his second spouse. He, uh, he had married Thankful Pratt, who had passed away. Mary Ann had, uh, was also a widow. They both fought one children, child into this marriage, and at the time, she is pregnant in, uh, in <coughs> Philadelphia, and she will sail with him to England, where she will help him in publishing all that he does. Orson Pratt will go to Scotland, um, where he goes to uh, uh, a hill known as Arthur's Seat and dedicates Scotland for the preaching of the gospel. Been there.
Next time you're there, why don't you say, Lord, I am not leaving this place till I baptize 200 people. <laughs> now, please remember that Elder Pratt at this time is 28 years old and a young married man, but he is a genius. When he gets to Nauvoo, he will write a book on calculus, which, you know, calculus is just being invented, but so he's in... <laughs> He's in Edinburgh, which is the hot spot of philosophy, physics, and astronomy. It's where all the thinkers are hanging out. And he begins to think <coughs> cosmology. It's, it's <coughs> Alfred Pratt's ideas about the universe and matter that wind up becoming part of, part of the things that we believe today about intelligence. And, and uh, he publishes, he publishes a, a pamphlet called An Interesting Account. What a simple name. That's the first pub published version of the first vision. It's not the first recorded one. Joseph Smith writes one down in 1830 and tells others in 38. This is the first one that's published. And uh, it's, it's wonderful. Thank you, Elder Pratt. His wife, Sarah, will be left home. We'll talk more about her. But uh, Sarah becomes, becomes a victim of a predator while, while Orson is in the field, and you've heard the John Bennett stories, and um, as, 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 because of this, uh, her confidence in plural marriage, of course, just can't even get started, because she was lied to about it by a predator before she was taught about it in the spirit of the Lord, and she will, she will wind up coming to Utah, staying with Orson, um, <coughs> but will consider herself an apostate most of her life and will raise her children out of the gospel. Um, that's an old picture of her, so I thought I'd show you this nice picture of Sister Pratt and their young family. Um, this is their, their daughter who died as an infant. And uh, while, uh, as Orson is leaving on his mission, they painted her into the picture as a small child. And I saw on the family search page, somebody had written, that couldn't be Lydia, she was dead. <laughs> and somebody wrote back, it's great. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what to do, because I've got to tell you Wilfred Woodruff's in a minute. Elder Woodruff's mission, Elder Woodruff's mission will explode. We'll talk about that next week. And, uh, and, and there's, a, there's still so many good things to talk about. So thank you for letting me subdivide the mission to England. Thank you for being here today. Thanks for paying attention. Thanks for uh, writing down your thoughts, feelings, and impressions that come to you because they are very likely the way the Lord is teaching you through, through a mechanism, through a lesson. You know, like, uh, like the brother of Jared walking up to the Lord and saying, I've got, I've got these things. You ever, you ever notice? He doesn't even say, he doesn't know what to call them. He's got things. May the Lord touch and inspire us all through the mechanism of the church history lesson in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. amen. Thanks, everybody.